In today's video, we will cover Mies van der Rohe Neue National Gallery in Berlin and also the biggest misconception about his architecture. We have lots to cover, let's start. The National Gallery is a very interesting building in Mies van der Rohe's timeline because it shows most of the characteristics of his work in one project. His career is basically split in two halves, 30 years in Europe and 30 years in the US. His architecture is always moving around the same themes and it develops in a very, very linear way and his production output is the same way as his work, very focalized and minimal. As you probably know, Mies van der Rohe was German, born in Aachen in 1896. Aachen is located in the Thailand a part of Germany, bordering with Netherlands and Belgium. And the place had an influence choosing to add the van der part to his name, together with his mother's maiden name, Roy, as his birth name was Maria Ludwig Michael Mies. At the age of 19, he moves to Berlin to develop his education as an architect, and he will work first in Bruno Paul's studio and later for Peter Behrens. While working on Peter Behrens' studio, he works together with Gropius and Le Corbusier. Imagine that trio only working in your studio. After working there for several years taking care of residential projects, he leaves the studio in 1912 to establish his own practice. His first projects will show clear classicist influences without an ornamentation, similar language we saw already in the Reels house, and an influence from Schinkel, like this Bismarck monument, clearly classicist. At this point, he still hasn't developed his own language. But in 1923, the project for the Friedrichstrasse skyscraper in Berlin, which would be one of the most pivotal projects in his career, shows a great shift. It moves away completely from more traditional materials towards lightness, concrete and glass opening the buildings to its surrounding, and already showing distinctions between load-bearing elements and non-load-bearing elements, a symbol of this new era. In the 15 years after that project, his work evolved massively, with space continuity, the separation between enclosure and structure, incorporating marble, metal, and glass. He designs the Weissenhof State and builds a project that would anticipate the social housing concept, the German pavilion in Barcelona, and you can see a video only about that project here, the Tugendhat House, the Lange and Esther's houses. Incredible projects packed in basically 15 years. He also collaborates with Lili Reich, designing lots of very successful furniture, like the Barcelona chairs and the Cheslon. And she influenced his architecture massively with the inclusion of curves and new materials, which softened the spaces in his architectures. He was also the Bauhaus director for three years, from 1930 to 1933. His last project in this European period was the Lemke House, built in 1933, also located in Berlin. All spaces are organized around the patio terrace, built with brick and a very traditional configuration of boxed room spaces, but very interesting nonetheless. During those last years, until he relocates to the US, he developed several projects but not built anything else, mostly due to the obvious changes the country was going through. In 1937, he moves to the US, to Chicago specifically, where he will stay for the next 30 odd years. During this period, he will focus mainly on two typologies, skyscrapers and great span buildings. Among the skyscrapers, we could cite the Seagram Building in New York, the Lakeshore Drive Apartments, the Colonnade in New Jersey, or the Lafayette Park Apartments in Detroit. But once he mastered this typology, he focused mainly on the great span buildings. And this typology will obviously be very important for the Neue National Gallery. Open and flexible spaces with minimal services that could be used and rearranged depending on the requirements of the moment, an expression of the monumentality of technique. The Crown Hall of the IIT in Chicago, clearly ordered and classical, which shares actually lots of language commonalities with the Neue National Gallery. And we will come back to this building later, so keep it in mind and the Convention Center, a massive uninterrupted space covered by a metal structure and interiors with walls of green marble. The Banking Pavilion of the Toronto Dominion Center, a project contemporary with the Neue National Gallery. But from all these examples, there is one more project worth mentioning. 
In 1957, Bacardi, the rum company, hired Mies to design an office without walls and no partitions where everybody, both officers and employees, could see each other. Mies designed this building, which is fundamentally the Neue National Gallery. But during this time, the Cuban Revolution is unraveling and the company Bacardi, like many other private companies, lost everything, which meant the project would never be built. In 1961, in Germany, they realized that their most successful architect is already 75 and won't have the chance to build a great and representative project in Germany after being abroad for almost 25 years. Therefore, the Senate of West Berlin, because Berlin was already split in two by the wall, decides to commission him with the construction of the new museum located in the city. Mies takes the Bacardi project and tries to reconfigure it to make it work in Berlin. The museum is located south of Potsdamer Platz, next to the Philharmonie and opposed to the State Library, both projects by Sharon, and next to St. Matthaus Church. The building is distributed in two levels, a semi-buried plinth, which contains all the main spaces of the museum and ends in a garden surrounded by the walls of the plinth. On the upper face of this plinth, a plaza is created that is accessed through two stairs or a ramp. The main staircase, frontal and aligned with the head of the building, and a lateral one towards the lowest part of the building. Additionally, there is a ramp on the side of the front. Where can we see some precedents to this element sequence in Mies architecture? Well, regarding the main stair with the frontal sequence, similar examples can be seen in the Crown Hall project and the Fansworth House. In the Tugendhat House and in the Barcelona Pavilion, you can see the plinths and the stairs running parallel to the main volume of the building, exactly the same as in this case with the secondary staircase. The upper structure is the most recognizable part of the building, although it is actually just the head of it. This universal space hosts the temporary exhibitions of the museum. A flow in space, continuous and with minimal partitioning and services. This is a very pure Mies part of the building, built solely with steel and glass. An architecture of the almost nothing, as he used to call it, but with a very classical order with those glass panels framing the outside, connecting the building with its surroundings, completely separated and independent from the supporting structure. And two supplied shafts covered in green Tino's marble. The 64 by 64 roof structure is supported by very visually strong eight cross-shaped elements, measuring 87 by 87 centimeters, conforming a peripteral space. Both the support and the roof structure follow the same creed and conform a very static space, not privileging a direction over the other. This is another Schinkel project that influenced this reticular structure. And talking about structure, let's compare the column detail in the museum with the Crown Hall and the Fansworth House. We can see quite a similar solution, but resolving the encounter between the vertical and the horizontal structure elements differently. The Crown Hall elements are resolved hanging the roof structure from the beams running across the building. And the Fansworth House, preferencing the vertical element, although still working in solidarity structurally. This covered plaza is connected with the opaque and partially buried spaces through the two main staircases and an elevator. The lower level is on the other hand built with concrete. It has an additional foyer space connecting all the exhibition and service rooms. And this level hosts all permanent exhibitions of the museum.
The exhibition space facing the garden shows a sequence of connected spaces separated by single walls, similar to the ones present in the German pavilion in Barcelona, instead of closed boxes for each room, more like a continuum that flows across the whole level space. I see often Mies architecture reduced to the always present less is more aphorism. And although this almost nothing was part of his search in architecture, it didn't define what he was trying to achieve really. He's seen very often as the most modern of the three big figures of the 20th century, so Mies, Corbu, and Frank Lloyd Wright, when his work relied and was in fact very rooted in classicism. In my opinion, the most classicist of the three. The main search in his architecture was to reconcile technology and new materials and society, the issue of technological development and integration, but never leaving classicism behind. A very linear development in his work that would rely in technology to create a very clear to read architecture and at the same time to create the image of modern light and thinness. He didn't embrace the constructivist approach through isometric representations, but always chose to show and draw his projects through ground-level perspectives, integrating the connection to the surroundings. This was a clear connection to the plane. So the removal of anything superfluous and unnecessary and the development of an architecture of skin and bones is in fact an important part, but it wasn't the ultimate goal of his work. And this is all for today. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please like, comment, share, and subscribe. You can as well follow me on Instagram and Twitter, and I hope to see you all in the next one. Thank you.